when you go to a website where a video is playing and your video lags, how does the website know that you are having a bad experience? Problems with video are often not complete failures. Maybe part of the video loads and plays just fine, and then the rest of the video is buffering. You've probably experienced sitting in front of a video, waiting for it to load as the loading wheel mysteriously spins. Since problems with video are often not complete failures, troubleshooting a problem with a user's video playback is not as straightforward as just logging whenever a crash occurs. You need to continuously monitor the video playback on every client device and aggregate it in a centralized system for analysis. The centralized logging system will allow you to separate problems with a specific user from problems with the video service itself. A single user could have bad Wi-Fi or have 50 tabs open with different videos, and that would be their fault. To identify problems that are caused by the video player or the company that is serving the video rather than a user, you need to capture the playback from every video and every user. Scott Kidder works at Mux, where he builds a streaming analytics system for video monitoring. In this episode, Scott explains how events make it from a video player onto the back-end analytics system running on Kinesis and Apache Flink. Events from the browser are constantly added to Kinesis, which is much like Apache Kafka. Apache Flink reads those events off of Kinesis and MapReduces them to discover anomalies. For example, if 100 users watch a 20-minute cat video, and the video stops playing at minute 12 for all 100 users, there's probably some data corruption in that video. And you would only be able to discover that by assessing all users, because if you looked at only one user and you noticed a problem at minute 12 for that user, well, you know, it's equally likely that the user could have bad Wi-Fi or have some, some problem there. That's why you need analytics on everybody. Scott and I discussed the streaming infrastructure that he works on at Mux, as well as other streaming systems like Spark, Apache Beam, and Kafka. This episode is one of a short series we're doing about streaming data infrastructure. I wanted to do some shows in preparation for the Strata Data Conference in March in San Jose, and I'll be attending there thanks to a complimentary ticket from O'Reilly. O'Reilly has been kind enough to give me free tickets to these conferences since Software Engineering Daily got started, and I did not have the money to attend any conferences. So I am always thankful to O'Reilly and their support of Software Engineering Daily. If you want to attend Strata, you can use the promo code PCSED to get 20% off. And also, if you want to find all of our old episodes about data streaming, big data, Hadoop, You can check out the Software Engineering Daily app on iOS or Android, which has all 650 of our episodes, and it's in a searchable format. We've got comments, related links, and it's all open source, which you can find by going to github.com slash softwareengineeringdaily. I hope you check it out and download the app or join our open source community. We try to be very welcoming to anybody that wants to come in and contribute code. And with that, let's get to this episode of Software Engineering Daily. Apps today are built on a wide range of backends, from traditional databases like Postgres to MongoDB and Elasticsearch, to file systems like S3. When it comes to analytics, the diversity and scale of these formats makes delivering data science and BI workloads very challenging. Building data pipelines seems like a never-ending job, as each new analytical tool requires designing from scratch. There's a new open source project called Dremio that is designed to simplify analytics on all these sources. It's also designed to handle some of the hard work, like scaling performance of analytical jobs. Dremio is the team behind Apache Arrow, a new standard for end-memory columnar data analytics. Arrow has been adopted across dozens of projects, like Pandas, to improve the performance of analytical workloads on CPUs and GPUs. It's free and open source. It's designed for everyone from your laptop to clusters of over 1,000 nodes. Check out Dremio today at dremio.com slash sedaily. Dremio solved hard engineering problems to build their platform, and you can hear about how it works under the hood 
by checking out our interviews with Dremio CTO Jacques Nadeau, as well as the CEO Tomer Shiran. And at dremio.com slash sedaily, you can find all the necessary resources to get started with Dremio for free. I'm really excited about Dremio. The shows we did about it were really technical and really interesting. If you like those episodes or you like Dremio itself, be sure to tweet at Dremio HQ and let them know you heard about it from Software Engineering Daily. Thanks again to Dremio and check it out at dremio.com slash sedaily to learn more. Scott Kidder is an engineer at Mux. Scott, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Glad to be here. Yeah, we've done a few shows about topics related to what we're going to discuss today. You are an engineer at Mux, and I've talked to the founders of Mux about what they're building. It's basically technologies around delivering online video or monitoring online video and I've also done a show about Flink, and today we're going to talk about the intersection of the two. But let's start with the idea of delivering online video. What is hard about that? Why is it hard for YouTube or Funny or Die or NBC.com, all these co- companies that they broker in video? What's hard about what they do? Great. Yeah. So what makes delivering video difficult is there are so many different client-side technologies and network technologies and server-side technologies that are involved in the encoding, management, and delivery, and ultimately the playback of video. There are just a lot of points in the, in the process where things can go wrong. It's not as simple as uh, plugging in an HDMI cable into your television and having it play back seamlessly. There, it's, it's a complicated process. And so what we're what we're doing at Mux is providing tools to um, give pu- uh, video publishers insight into that process and ultimately provide a better experience for their their customers. As somebody is delivering video, like if I'm CBS.com and I'm delivering a video to a user, what analytics can be generated in that? process of the streaming that are going to help resolve potential issues? Like what is the monitoring output stream look like and where is it being generated? Is it on the client side? Is it on the server side? What are the analytics that we're concerned with here? Great question. So we've got analytics that we get from, in the case of uh, some CDNs, we actually get information about time to first byte. So that's the amount of time that it takes for the actual video content to start streaming to the end user device. We also have information about the round trip time, which is the total amount of time that it takes for a video segment or a manifest or some other video asset to ultimately be delivered to the client. And then we have client side metrics that include all kinds of different metrics that kind of re- represent the quality of experience for the end user. Things like buffering, quality shifts up and down as it's adapting to changes in in the bitrate that's, that's sustainable for that client connection. So we actually get those metrics transmitted from the client devices themselves to the MUX service. And uh, over, over the life of a video playback session, we'll accumulate all of those metrics. And once the video view is finished, we'll kind of flatten them out and provide a complete picture about what that particular user experienced while they were watching a video. What are the requirements for building an end-to-end video analytics monitoring system? Right. At the client side, the first thing that you need is a client SDK, a library that allows you to integrate with the video player. So we support HTML5 and VideoJS web players, so we can actually tap into events that the player is seeing as it's downloading video assets and, and playing them. So that's the client SDK side. We've, we also have native SDKs that allow us to capture video events for playback on in native apps. So the SDKs periodically send beacons that indicate information about what is happening during that video playback session. And so those beacons are just sent over plain HTTP to uh, collectors that we have, which quickly throw the beacons onto a, uh, a Kinesis stream. So in that case, it's like a... Uh, a distributed event log that is sharded. So all of the events associated with a particular playback session go to the exact same shard. And then we have processors that then read from a specific shard 
and they kind of aggregate all of the beacons associated with a, with many different video sessions. So then once those video views finish or they encounter some sort of error, we then, like I mentioned earlier, they, they kind of flatten it, flatten it out and compute these things like the overall buffer, the amount of time, amount of time spent buffering during playback, identifying any errors that happen during playback. And we're then able to compute a, a, a picture that represents what that particular video view looked like. So if I understand correctly, let's say you've got 10 users that are watching a video about a cat, and those 10 users all are watching that video in the browser, and the browser is the player the the browser player is logging events to your mux endpoint and the mux endpoint is ingesting all of those events it's sharding them by the individual user but it's also got uh, what was the word you used the tags or the markings what was the word you used to associate the the different videos to 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 make sure that you're sharding by the individual user but you want to be able to correlate that they're all watching the all those different users are watching the video yeah so we've got got a shard where it's sharded by the video view id so a single mm-hmm. a single user could have and can and will probably have multiple views uh, but all their views go to the exact same shard so it's all sharded deterministically. And then we've got processors that are pulling beacons off of a shard. Beacon. Yeah. And so the, the beacons represent uh, just a snapshot in time indicating uh, you know, what's, what's happening in the player at that given moment. And so then we accumulate all the beacons for the, over the life of that video view. And then we collapse it all once the view is finished. Mm-hmm. Right. So with... This sharding schema, you basically have a way to differentiate if a user, if if the if an error is happening within a video, then you can determine if it is correlated among a user, uh, like within a, a user's identity. And if all if all the videos that that user watches has this particular problem, maybe it's a problem on the user side. But if you can figure out that. 10 different users watching the same video have that problem, then it's probably a problem with the video. Right. And so when we started building Mux, we were making those, we were able to make those sort of conclusions using a, a, an offline batch process that at hourly intervals would, would um, do these sorts of, of roll-ups that are able to compute those, those types of ob- observations. But we needed something that, we needed a, the ability to provide error rate alerts that were more timely than just an hour. And so that's kind of what led us into, uh, into Apache Flink. So what we did with Apache Flink was as soon as a video view is over, is, is finished, or there's been some, some sort of error during playback, our processors then send information about that video view to a second Kinesis stream that is read by an Apache Flink app. So Apache Flink was, we were looking at different stream processing systems and uh, Apache Flink just really fit the bill for what we needed to do, which was uh, have very low latency, also high availability, the ability to read from not just Kinesis, but also Kafka, other stream sources. And it's, it's word, worked really well for us in building this uh, anomaly detection error rate alerting application. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, I want to get to Flink eventually, but I want to start a little bit earlier in the pipeline uh, because this term streaming, when I first started doing some shows about streaming, I really had a whole lot of trouble understanding the difference between streaming and batch. And I think that the best way to actually disambiguate is just to really dive into the pipeline and, and explain how it works. So you've got these just events that are being thrown onto Kinesis. And Kinesis is a distributed, scalable queuing service, pub-sub service, much like Apache Kafka, but it's hosted by AWS. And I think for all intents and purposes, we can think of it as very similar to Kafka. So that's familiar to people who have, have heard shows about Kafka. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, that's perfect. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you get all these events and they're thrown onto the Kinesis queue. Well, do you call the Kinesis queue a stream as well, or do you just call it a queue? It's a it's a stream. Okay, just a stream of events, basically. Right, but, because um, um, in the case of a queue, an 
an item that has been added to the queue is it ultimately removed from the queue. And once it's removed from the queue, it is gone forever, most likely. But in the mm. case of a stream, you can actually have multiple consumers on that stream that are at different locations in the stream. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's one of the most uh, powerful aspects of, of Kinesis and Kafka is their ability to have multiple consumers that are reading at different points in the stream and are able to, you know, process the stream in different ways and not be, they're not subject to the same limitations that you have with a, with a traditional queue. Indeed. So we can think of the Kinesis stream as the stream, and then Flink is the reader or the processor of the events on those streams. Would, would you say that's accurate? Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this Flink streaming technology, this is one of a bunch of different stream processing slash batch processing technologies that can be used basically for processing raw events, for doing correlations among raw events, for doing aggregations among raw events. Basically, the the earliest days of this kind of technology was Hadoop, which did it in batch. Right. Just a, a traditional ETL extract transform load process where you throw data onto a disk and then you process it in batch offline with potentially a lot of latency, but you get deterministic results. How would you characterize the movement from the earliest days of Hadoop, Hadoop MapReduce, to whatever we have now with this cornucopia of different streaming frameworks? Right. So it's it all comes down to just needing data as quickly as possible, needing to interpret and draw conclusions from data as soon as it's generated. In the, the example that I mentioned earlier with the one hour delay in, in, in processing video view events, it was just too long. And I think a lot of, a lot of companies are facing uh, similar requirements where data is being generated and it needs to be processed as, as quickly as possible. And streaming platforms like Apache Flink really enable that. Why is it so much easier to do it in batches than in streams? Well, that's a great question. I, I think that uh, batch processing is, is a concept that has been around for a very long time and a lot of people are comfortable with it. Obviously you get you get deterministic results in, in making those calculations as opposed to lambda architectures where you end up having kind of a, like a speed layer. It's is I've seen it called a speed layer and then a then a batch layer where the speed layer is meant to serve uh, like a front end application and provide probably like imprecise, oftentimes imprecise results. And then a batch layer which then kind of comes up comes around later and then cleans up the results. Lambda architectures like that have have been popular in the past, built with Hadoop and Apache Spark. But I think that the idea of like building building two applications essentially, building a speed layer and a batch layer is undesirable. And Apache technologies like Apache Flink make it possible to have the accuracy that you get from the batch layer while also being able to have the speed that you get from the speed layer in, the, in like a Lambda architecture and only develop a single application. It's really the best of both worlds. A thank you to our sponsor, Datadog, a cloud monitoring platform bringing full visibility to dynamic infrastructure and applications. Create beautiful dashboards, set powerful machine learning-based alerts, and collaborate with your team to resolve performance issues. You can start a free trial today and get a free t-shirt from Datadog by going to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash Datadog. Datadog integrates seamlessly with more than 200 technologies, including Google Cloud Platform, AWS, Docker, PagerDuty, and Slack. With fast installation and setup, plus APIs and open source libraries for custom instrumentation, Datadog makes it easy for teams to monitor every layer of their stack in one place. But don't take our word for it. You can start a free trial today, and Datadog will send you a free t-shirt. Visit softwareengineeringdaily.com slash Datadog to get started. Thank you to Datadog. If you asked somebody from Apache Spark or Storm, 
the technologies that are not Flink, you know, why their technologies have evolved in such a way or were created in such a way where if you wanted to do some sort of streaming system, you, you would probably want to do a Lambda architecture where you have both bat, you have stream processing that may be imprecise and you have batch processing to reconcile that imprecise stream processing what would they tell you about like why they made the trade-offs that forced them to to ha- sort of have this lambda architecture like help me understand let's frame what the trade-offs are that those systems are making versus flink sure apache spark is a very mature project and that was actually a, a consideration that we had to to take into account when we were choosing whether to, to use apache flink or something else it's a bit of a gamble taking Taking a risk with a less mature project like Apache Flink, there are a lot of engineers who are familiar with Apache Spark. It's a it's very widely known. So I, I think that Apache Spark has that going for it. It traditionally, well, it started out as a as purely a batch processing system and, and they've added support for streaming, which uh, for a while was referred to as micro batching, where it essentially acts like a stream processing platform but under the hood, it's really just processing data in micro batches, which in a way can be that can be said of just about any stream processing platform. But the difference with Apache Flink is that it's a stream processing platform first. So it's kind of the, the inverse, right? So it's stream processing platform that can operate as a stream as a batch processing platform. Whereas Spark is the other way around. It was batch first, and then they implemented stream processing on top of that that batch processing system. When I first started doing shows around these topics, I think I made a mistake in that I was thinking that these were interchangeable frameworks, sort of like, you know, you look at the different front-end frameworks like React.js or Vue.js or AngularJS. You really only pick one of these. They're kind of the same siblings. They have very similar ways of looking at the world and you're you're probably not going to combine them but i think it's a different story with the streaming frameworks like my understanding of spark is that basically what spark did differently was instead of having this hadoop mentality the hadoop mentality is you run this big hadoop job and after it's done with that job it has to it has to write to disk the idea with spark is like you load your data into a working set in memory and you can do an operation on it, which is sort of a batch operation, but then it sits in memory after that operation is done. And then you might want to do another big operation on it. And it, it's going to continue to do these operations over a working set in memory. So these are, you could consider these big bulky batch operations, but because it's all in memory, it's it's faster. It, would you say it's an accurate uh, description of Spark? Yeah, it's it's a traditional ETL t- type of job where it's just operating on the data that's that's in memory, and that's true of Flink as well. Reads from a stream source, does a MapReduce style operation on it, and uh, has a has the potential to keep those results in memory, or send them to an external system, or have those feed into another job. And I think that's true of of Spark as well. So Flink can do a big map reduce over a bunch of uh, events that are sitting in Kinesis, but it can also do something where it's got some working set in memory and it just ingests one-off events to continue building some sort of in-memory record. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. And I'll give you an example from the air rate alerting app that we built at Mux. So Perfect. We send information about video views that had errors or didn't have errors to this Apache Flink app, which then does a map operation on a couple different breakdowns. So it'll do a map operation on video title. So my cat video (laughs) might be like a, a particular video title. And we want to see what the error rate is for that particular cat video. And so we'll accumulate a fixed number of video views, like 100 video views, for that title. And then we'll calculate the error rate that we observed for those 100 views for the known error types for that particular customer property. So we'll suppose we find out that from those 100 views, we had a 5% error rate. Well, what 
makes this a little challenging is uh, different different customers have different different normal error rates. So five percent error rate might be really good for one customer. It might be really terrible for another. And so we we've been able to avoid defining static error rate thresholds by accumulating uh, at a second step, accumulating observed error rates for each customer property. And then we can do a, a calculation to find out what their statistically normal error rate is, and then compare this most recently observed error rate against that kind of definition of what normal is. And then use that, that determination to decide whether to open an error rate alert or close an error rate alert. So what's what's really cool is that we're able to bring on new customers, observe what is what their normal error rates are, which can and do change over time without any like manual configuration required on our part or on the part of our customer. And that's all possible with Apache Flink because it accumulates all this this uh, data that it keeps in memory as part of the uh, the job state. Now, by the way, that's pretty awesome moat you're building there because if you're doing all these analytics on all these different videos, you probably have an idea of how video performance works, like a pretty differentiated data set of how video performance works agnostic of a specific customer. Yeah, we're applying that kind of approach to our next product, which is a, a video delivery product. where we'll actually- Which I've seen, by the way, which is amazing. Oh, and you. the potential of that is just huge. Yeah. So we're not just looking at error rates for a particular customer and finding out what normal is for them. We have plans to look at error rates for different types of, or not just error rates, but also uh, quality of experience metrics for types of videos, different geographies, different CDNs, and really optimize the encoding and delivery of video for all those different factors. And Flink plays a very important role in that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm enamored with the, the business, but I guess, so back to the anomaly detection. So let's say company, let's say CBS uploads this new breaking news cat video and a bunch of people start watching it instantly. And I guess they start watching it. And then as soon as they start watching it, you're starting to get these new, a shard of a new type of video and you're instantly starting to aggregate those views into a new flink system a new flink memory partition or something like maybe you could just tell me what happens when cbs uploads a new video and you're starting to monitor that video because you want to be able to alert them if something is wrong with right it. so with our existing data product what happens is um, they've got a web player or a native player that is instrumented to send us information about video views that happen on their site or in their app. Playback starts, we start getting beacons with a video ID or a view ID rather that is globally unique. We'll start accumulating all those video, video view beacons. An error occurs or the video view finishes. We send all the details to a Kinesis stream that is monitored by Apache Flink. And Apache Flink then does a map, adds, it performs a, uh, a map function on that video view to map it to a particular video title and also to a uh, the customer property. So we can actually detect kind of site-wide issues for a customer, like across all of CBS, not just for that particular CAD view, <laughs> CAD video title, but also across an entire customer site. So we'll, we'll add that vi video view to a map operation, which accumulates a fixed number of video views. So we use counting windows. So it's a uh, accumulate video views until we reach a certain target number, like a thousand video views or a hundred video views, at which point we'll then do a reduce operation, which then performs all the, it calculates all the error rates for the different error types that we know to exist for that customer. Then we compare those error rates against what is statistically normal for that customer. And then we decide whether to alert. And so all of this is just happening continuously, just that map operation of accumulating all these video views and then collapsing it with the reduce and then comparing it against normal. That's just happening all the time. And Flink just does a phenomenal job of, of making that really simple. They've got beautiful APIs that made uh, developing this system really, really intuitive and easy. Although your example would 
bring up something. I, I did a couple interviews with people from data, the Google Dataflow project, and one of the things that they say is that this whole idea of batch versus streaming is kind of a red herring or misnomer or whatever. And when I think about your example, you've got all these views that are getting mapped, and then you have this periodic reduce function. It seems like the reduce is kind of a batch. That's like a little batch job. It is, job. yeah. So there is some latency that's that's introduced there, just having to uh, accumulate video views and um, and then do the reduce operation. So you do have to strike a balance in, in picking, in our case, the size of the window, the number of video views to accumulate before you you do the reduce operation because that does affect the, like in our case, it affects the speed of reporting too large of a window and it could take a long time to actually fill. But yeah, the, uh, the data flow team is doing a lot of interesting work developing APIs that are in compatible with uh, the beam spec, which uh, link aspires to, and, and to a large degree is compatible with, with. So it's, that was a, also a, a, a big, selling point on Flink was its compatibility with the Beam API and it being also inspired by the uh, the mill wheel design paper that came out of Google and, and influenced Google Dataflow product. Okay, Beam is one of the most confusing <laughs> things I have ever tried to report yeah. on. They were explaining it to me and I just did not understand it. It's like something like... So it's like an API they introduced where you can make your oh my god can you just explain apache beam <laughs> just just give well, an explanation see if we can just a quick disclaimer i've never actually used apache flink via the beam api but okay. it its goal is to have a set of apis that are portable across stream processing platforms like apache flink and google data flow okay. so the idea is in theory you should be able to write an application against that uses the Beam APIs and then actually have it run on Apache Flink or Dataflow with little to no modification. So it's very powerful in that way. And this is, I guess, useful yeah. because we're talking, I mean, we, we just talked about how you could basically describe these same operations to Spark or to Flink or to Hadoop or to Storm or to Dataflow you could describe these operations to each of these different systems. You're probably going to get different latencies. You're probably going to get different, like, how much it costs to run. So there's probably a high degree of, of variability among the different systems that you could run them on, but they should be able to run them all. These are all basically Turing-complete distributed processing yeah, systems. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's really one of the really cool potential things I'd, I'd love to see somebody provide the ability to submit a beam application to or an application that uses the beam APIs to a runner, a yep. set of runners, maybe one that's using spark, one that's using flink, one's data flow and provide information about the cost, you know, the operational cost, the performance, you know, portability ac across uh, cloud providers and, okay. and really just, be able to make a decision that way instead of it being a uh, Flink versus Spark versus Dataflow type battle, right? Just be very pragmatic about it and simply choose the, the tool that's, that's best for that job. Amazon Redshift powers the analytics of your business and Intermix.io powers the analytics of your Redshift. Your dashboards are loading slowly. Your queries are getting stuck. Your business intelligence tools are choking on data. The problem could be with how you are managing your Redshift cluster. Intermix.io gives you the tools that you need to analyze your Amazon Redshift performance and improve the tool chain of everyone downstream from your data warehouse. The team at Intermix has seen so many Redshift clusters, they are confident that they can solve whatever performance issues you are having. Go to intermix.io slash sedaily to get a 30-day free trial of Intermix. Intermix.io gives you performance analytics for Amazon Redshift. Intermix collects all your Redshift logs and makes it easy to figure out what's wrong so that you can take action all in a nice, intuitive dashboard. 
The alternative is doing that yourself, running a bunch of scripts to get your diagnostic data and then figuring out how to visualize and manage it. What a nightmare and a waste of time. Intermix is used by Postmates, Typeform, Udemy, and other data teams who need insights into their Redshift cluster. Go to intermix.io slash sedaily to try out your free 30-day trial of Intermix and get your Redshift cluster under better analytics. Thanks to Intermix for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Okay, so now I get it. I know that, that this feels gratifying because now I get it and it seems like... You know, nobody's saying who won the database war. Was it Postgres? Was it Cassandra? Was it HDFS? Was it CockroachDB? Was it InfluxDB? That would be a ridiculous right, argument. Right, exactly, yeah. That, that's... They've all got their own strengths and weaknesses, and uh, it's really about finding the best tool for the job. Right, and so Flink's differentiation, or at least one of its differentiations, I think I saw you say this, or it was written in the documentation somewhere or something, Flink has the ability to handle unbounded event streams with exactly once event processing. Is Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, that's right. Yep. Okay. Why is that hard to implement? It's <laughs> it's hard to implement because not all, not all systems have the checkpointing capabilities that Flink has. Actually, the... Uh, they say exactly once processing, but what they mean is at least at least exactly once or something to that effect. <laughs> um, because what happens is uh, you end up having Flink applications that have they call out to other systems and maybe they write a record to a database or they put a message on another Kinesis stream. Those side effects can't really be undone. But so in that way, it's like it, you could end up having uh, a Flink application that has a side effect that is repeated multiple times. But when you've got a Flink application that's running, it actually, and it reads a message from a stream, it keeps track of its position in that stream, and it keeps track of all the operators that are part of the application, the Flink application graph, what their particular state is. And so then when the the Flink application is checkpointed or save pointed to durable storage, like, so Flink, Flink applications typically use uh, HDFS to persist their their internal state. You might configure a Flink ap- application to checkpoint it every five minutes or every ten minutes or something like that. And so what it does is it it sends uh, information about it. It writes information about its state to dur- durable storage, and it also updates information in Zookeeper about where it is in the stream and and the location of the m- most recent uh, checkpoint data that's written on HDFS. So then if that if that Flink application stops or it needs to be restarted, or if you have to upgrade, et cetera, what happens is the Flink job manager and task managers, they actually load their state from that previous save point or checkpoint that's on HDFS, and they'll resume. There might be some period of time from when the last save point was, was taken, which could lead to reprocessing of messages and you know, side effects like I mentioned earlier. You know, writing a or writing a record to a database again, or putting an additional message on a on a queue. But f- that application continues to process without interruption. Tell me what I misunderstand uh, about <laughs> the system. Um, no, 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 no. That was actually really good. A Flink processing pipeline is this basically a, a directed acyclic graph of different computational steps. You're going to have these different computational steps in your data pipeline. And at each computational step, you do some processing, and then it's the data is then ready for the next step. And at different intervals, you're going to want to checkpoint the, the data that has been processed in a given step to disk in case some something crashes and you're halfway through a full pipeline being being finished. Do I have it right so far? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so when this checkpointing occurs in one of the nodes in the DAG, it's going to be checkpointed to HDFS. Does that block things? Like if you have to checkpoint at one of these nodes in the DAG, does that block processing or is it some kind of asynchronous thing? It's it's asynchronous. It's it's really 
quite beautiful the way that Flink has implemented it. You could think of it as standing. Imagine yourself standing at, at uh, you know at at a stream and you drop a marker into the stream. Right, you drop something that floats and it it, it flows down the stream, and different points along the way, different operators that are part of this graph, they see the marker and then they checkpoint their state. And so meanwhile, upstream from from where that, that marker was placed, it can actually continue processing, right? It can still continue reading. But meanwhile, that marker flows down the stream of, of the application. And then once it reaches the end nodes, all the syncs, then that checkpoint or save point operation is considered complete. But it doesn't block operators that are upstream of where the marker currently is from continuing to, to operate. That is beautiful. That's pretty cool. So is it problematic to do all that checkpointing or does it get garbage collected or something? It's not really problematic. It introduces a small... It's just op- disk, I guess. Disk is cheap. Well, it's it's disk, but it's network IO. So depending on, depending on the, the size of the data that you're keeping in memory, the checkpoint operations can can actually start to impact the, the performance of your of your app. So recently Flink added support for partial checkpoints. So just doing the deltas from the last time it did a checkpoint. And that's had a huge led to a huge imp- improvement in performance. Because if, if you're dealing with an app that uh, a Flink app that has on the order of gigabytes or, or terabytes worth of data that's stored in memory, checkpointing that or say pointing that every five minutes means tra- trans potentially transferring all of that data to HDFS. And, and that's very expensive, both in terms of storage and network IO, et cetera. So just being able to checkpoint the deltas is very valuable. Really good descriptions there. Part of these streaming architectures that tends to happen is you you often have a processing system that pulls data off of the Kinesis or Kafka like stream main stream system, do some processing, and then write back to the Kinesis on a different a different uh, channel or a different ch- shard or partition or whatever. I, I'm not I don't remember what the uh, terminology right, is. Right. But you write it back to the to the Kinesis queue or the Kafka queue, and then. It, it makes it available to other systems to either pull off of for more processing or whatever. Can you help me understand, like, when are people, when do people want to do all of their processing in a single Flink job versus writing it back to Kinesis and making it available to other people or writing it back to Kafka and making it available for other people? This seems like a burgeoning area that's, like, pretty important. Like, how do you manage the different channels in your data stream right i, I mentioned does that the, question uh, make sense yeah it does i uh, i'm actually going to just relate it to a, a flink app that we wrote for our video product that ties in really well with what you the problem that you just described so we get access logs for our video product from our cdn providers so every time a video chunk is requested or a, a video manifest is requested our cdn provider provides us with a log record that indicates, you know, the the URL of that particular piece of media that was requested, performance metrics about it, etc. What we're doing is we're taking that log record and putting it on a Kafka topic, and then we've got a Flink application that reads from that Kafka topic, and then it queries a database to kind of enhance that log record, find out information about the video resolution, its audio and video bit rates, customer information, etc. And it kind of like decorates it, enhances it, enhances that log record, and then puts it on a second Kafka topic that we'll eventually use for billing because we have like kind of a, a metered like usage-based billing system for, for video. So we'll find out how many, the duration of video that was requested or did the duration of video that we served for a particular customer over the last month, et cetera. But we also use that same, those same log records to feed into our monitoring system. So we actually, after we decorated that, that uh, log record, we then do a map reduce operation on it to calculate round trip time and all these other performance metrics that we're interested in for actually monitoring the real time quality of experience for users of our video service. And so those metrics are written into an InfluxDB database 
that we've got Grafana dashboards for. And so, and then we've got Grafana dashboards that we show in our engineering area that show the, the current health of the system. So this is an example of a, of a Flink application that is serving multiple purposes, right? So it's, it's enhancing log records and feeding them into a second Kafka topic to be used for billing, but then it's also helping us with monitoring the health of the service. Wow. Well, Kinesis is really your master database. <laughs> yeah, well, we've got, we use Kinesis for stream processing in AWS, which is where our, our data product lives. But our video product, we're trying to have that run in multiple cloud providers. So Google Cloud, AWS, and so Kafka really fit the bill there because it it's easy to deploy in, in any cloud provider, whereas uh, Kinesis is, it's uh, an AWS only product. And so we're using Kafka and Kinesis with Flink and have had really no problems with, with either. The Flink t- team provides for uh, Kinesis and for Kafka has just been phenomenal. Support, is it uh, like data artisan support or is it just like through message boards and stuff? Through message boards, the Flink users email list is great. They're very responsive on the, the Jira bug tracker as well. We've At Mux, we've com- uh, committed several features back to features and bug fixes back to the the Flink product. And they've been very receptive and just really great, great partners in that way. Are you deploying Kafka on Kubernetes? Yeah. So we've got Kafka, HDFS, Flink, all running on Kubernetes. I don't know if you've set up Kafka before, but like, was it easier because of Kubernetes? Or have you talked to people about like, did, does Kafka become significantly easier to deploy and manage with Kubernetes? Well, I think uh, deploying on Kubernetes was our goal from from the outset. The vast majority of our our services code that we write, as well as just third party code, is deployed using containers that run on Kubernetes. Uh, so having a, a kind of having like an, a homogenous production environment is is really desirable. And we've we've not had any uh, performance issues or deployment issues with with Kafka yet. You know, knock on wood. Isn't that remarkable? Isn't it remarkable how, how much infrastructure you can stand up these days and how complicated it can be and it, it actually like works? Absolutely, yeah. Just, you know, don't look too hard. It's it's all working. <laughs> you know, <laughs> all these all these things are able to talk to each other and it's it's not an issue. Yeah. It's it's pretty it's it is pretty amazing. So it seems like people have a pretty good handle over how to work with different microservices. An, an increasing use case, well, seems like these data streams, like being able to keep track of your data streams, like you just discussed these data streams that you're reusing in different places. It, it, do you have some centralized schema or list of the different data streams that are available, maybe with some documentation or descriptions around the data streams? Because these things, you could almost look at these like microservices where, yeah, you've got, like, if you want to pull this particular type of data stream, you have to know where it is. You have to know, like, how to access it, right? Exactly. Yeah. So there's, we do keep well, we use a Kubernetes manifest to configure Kafka with all of the different topics that are available on a particular set of Kafka brokers. And so that's documented and those manifests are checked into source control. And so it's it's pretty easy to see and know which broker or which topics you'd expect to find on a set of Kafka brokers. But then there's also the problem of knowing how to send and consume data from those topics. So for that, we're we use protobuf encoding for all of the messages that we send and consume from from Kafka and Kinesis. Protobuf is very efficient and easy to work with, and yeah, so that's we've got the protobuf specs that are checked into source control as well. And so it's it's all pretty clear as far as which topics or streams you can you can publish and consume from, and then also how you how, what the format of the messages are. I've done some shows with people who will talk about these systems like Looker, for example, and they'll say that one of the problems that Looker was seeking to solve, and there's a whole class of these kinds of tools like Tableau, for example, where it's trying to solve this problem where you've got analysts in a company, data analysts, 
And it's really hard to get the data analysts access to the data if they are not super tech savvy, if they don't know how to do a MapReduce job or like a Hive job or whatever. I think Looker, the, the Looker type tools did a did a pretty good job of solving these in a batch fashion. I'm wondering if it, this is entering like a whole new tier of of complexity for the analyst. Like, how does the analyst? It's it's very easy to understand. Like, okay, if an analyst gets a daily updated CSV or an updated MySQL database or whatever with data that they can analyze. That seems very easy to reason about for the analyst, but maybe less so if they've got these streams that are constantly updating you to subscribe to them. Is there a usable infrastructure for the less technical user to access that kind of data? That's a great question. There is a lot of interest from business units like as far as being able to access this data directly. I know that Netflix is using Flink very heavily to basically provide like a self-service type interface to a lot of use like usage data from the Netflix uh, players so that engineers uh, aren't necessarily, uh, you know, kind of serving requests for, from uh, business, business groups uh, trying to run into, you know, one-off queries, trying to make it more of a self-service type system. But that does require a lot of, a lot of documentation about how to interact with these streams. And yeah, that is absolutely a tough problem. Okay, well, um, I know we're up against time. We did go into your event ingestion and processing architecture in some detail. Uh, Just to summarize it for people, you've got these user events that get loaded into Kinesis. They get processed, and they get processed by, for example, well, they get processed by Flink. And then after they get processed, maybe they go, well, maybe they can continue through a long Flink job. Maybe they get written back to Kinesis. Eventually, they get put into Postgres or InfluxDB, or they get put, put, put back into Kinesis, maybe for further processing or just for access to for the billing team or whatever. Uh, there's a whole lot more about the whole event ingestion architecture, the map reducing, and so on in these talks that you've given, and I'll put those in the show notes. But since we're up against time, I just want to ask like a little bit of a high level question. So you've you've been working in in in, in video infrastructure for a long time. You were with Matt and John at their their previous company, which was uh, another basically another video infrastructure company. Do you have any? Big takeaways from what the canonical engineering problems in video are? Yeah, it's John uh, was one of the uh, the founders of Zencoder, which was one of the first uh, cloud-based video encoding services. Matt has a lot of video experience as well, has worked on Video.js and has a deep understanding of what it takes to, uh, what some of the problems are with uh, actually playing video and and why it remains a difficult problem. One of the biggest problems is just the diverse landscape for the types of devices that that we watch video on, the networks that are involved in delivering video. Some are fast, some are slow. It's it's a complex landscape out there, and it's really tough for producers of video to understand all of these problems. They know that they have a high quality input video, and they want it to look as good as possible on end user devices. Picking bit rates and picking resolutions is not for the faint of heart, and traditional online video platforms, it's a decision that producers would have to make once. And then they're, in many cases, they're stuck with those decisions for years to come unless they want to re-encode their video. What we're trying to solve at Mux is really future-proofing your video. So you give us your highest quality video and we'll deliver it optimally now and well into the future. And so that's really what, what sets us apart. Well, I can't wait until... YouTube is not the only game in town for sharing video because I think that's like the big elevator pitch of how Mux could be really big is like making video really easy to share without having to use the kludgy YouTube yeah. player. Well, and and no disrespect uh, to YouTube, nothing against they, YouTube. They do a phenomenal <laughs> job, but uh, there, <laughs> they there are a lot of uh, video publishers and just media publishers that would like to be responsible for, you know, serving their own content in, in a way that's not necessarily, uh, you know, tied to YouTube or branded with YouTube, but they shouldn't necessarily have to uh, sacrifice quality in terms of video or, you know, the experience for their users. Wistia was pretty early, early to this game, but it seems like I think Wistia maybe is, uh, I guess, less modular than the Mux, the Mux approach, what you guys are going for. 
Yeah, Wistia is their traditional online online video platform. They've uh, actually been one of our, our Mux Data customers. They've oh. had great success with integrating with Mux Data as well. Mm. All right, well, Scott, really great talking to you. Very technical conversation. I think we did a good job of getting from the high level to the fairly low level. It was great talking to you. Thanks. Likewise. If you are building a product for software engineers or you are hiring software engineers, Software Engineering Daily is accepting sponsorships for 2018. Send me an email, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com if you're interested. With 23,000 people listening Monday through Friday and the content being fairly selective for a technical listener, Software Engineering Daily is a great way to reach top engineers. And I know that the listeners of Software Engineering Daily are great engineers because I talk to them all the time. I hear from CTOs, CEOs, directors of engineering who listen to the show regularly. I also hear about many newer, hungry software engineers who are looking to level up quickly and prove themselves. And to find out more about sponsoring the show, you can send me an email or tell your marketing director to send me an email, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com. And if you're a listener to the show, thank you so much for supporting it through your audience ship. That is quite enough, but if you're interested in taking your support of the show to the next level, then look at sponsoring the show through your company. So send me an email at jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com. Thank you. Wow.